So we can begin. We will continue from where we left in the morning. So in this section, we are going to start from the chest wall. We are also going to look at the mechanisms of ventilation, mechanisms of gas transport, as well as congenital malformations of the respiratory system. Let's begin with organization of the chest wall. So the chest wall can be viewed to consist of the skeletal framework as well as the muscular framework. What I mean is that there are bones or other skeletal system that form the framework of the chest wall, but there are also muscles that constitute the framework of the chest wall. Let's start with the skeletal framework. The skeletal framework of the chest wall consists of the rib cage, as well as the vertebral column. Remember when you talk of rib cage, you are referring to the ribs and the sternum. <clears throat> You'll remember that uh, for ribs, there are a total of 12 pairs. These ribs can be classified into two. We have the true ribs and the false ribs. The true ribs refer to the upper seven ribs. The reason we call them true ribs is because their cartilage reach the sternum. The cartilage of the true ribs reach the sternum. So we call them true ribs. And the opposite is true for the false ribs. Their cartilages don't reach the sternum. For rib number eight, nine, and 10, their cartilage join the cartilage of the rib above. For example, the cartilage of rib eight joins that of rib seven. And the cartilage of rib nine joins the one of rib eight. The cartilage of rib 10 joins the one of rib nine. So for rib number eight, nine, and 10, their cartilages join the cartilage of the rib above. For rib 11 and 12, their cartilages don't join anything. And so we call them floating ribs. Well, they are still false ribs, but a special category of false ribs that we're now calling floating ribs. For the sternum, you remember we mentioned that the sternum has three parts. From here to somewhere, there is the manubrium of the sternum. From there to somewhere, there is the body of the sternum. And this lower end of the sternum is called the xiphoid process of the sternum. The sternal angle is a junction between the manubrium and the body of the sternum. The sternal angle corresponds to the second costal cartilage, the second rib that is. And because it corresponds with the second rib, we can therefore use the sternal angle as a landmark of reference if you want to count the intercostal spaces. The reason is because in a living person, the clavicle here usually overlies the first rib. And so you may not be able to clinically be able to palpate the first rib so if you want to count the intercostal spaces, the spaces between the ribs, then we can't rely on the first rib, but we can rely on the second rib because this is the sternal angle, which you can be able to feel even in an obese person. So this is how we usually count them. You identify the sternal angle, then the rib corresponding with the second rib, then you start counting so you call that the second space, third space, fourth space, downwards like that. It becomes an important landmark, the sternal angle. So we mentioned that uh, apart from the rib cage, the thoracic cage is also, or rather the skeletal framework is also made up of the, the spine. <clears throat> 
the specific segment of the spine that forms the framework of the chest cavity is the thoracic spine. Just like any other part of the vertebral column, the spine consists of vertebrae, intervertebral discs, and ligaments. Now for the thoracic spine, you remember that there are 12 vertebra named T1 up to T12. Okay, now the muscular framework. So in talking about muscular framework, we are talking about the muscles that constitute the chest wall. The muscles that constitute the chest wall can be classified into two. We have what we call the intrinsic muscles of the chest wall. The intrinsic muscles of the chest wall are limited to the ribs. They just come from one rib to another. These intrinsic muscles of the chest wall are therefore known as the intercostal muscles. We have three types of intercostal muscles. The outermost one is what we are calling the external intercostal muscle. The one in the middle layer is called the internal intercostal muscle. And then the most internal is called the innermost intercostal muscle. So you have three layers of intercostal muscles. They come from one rib to another. And that is why we call them intrinsic because they come from one rib to another rib. They are intrinsic muscles. Also, they are called intercostal muscles because they are between ribs. External intercostal, internal intercostal, and innermost intercostal. The intercostal muscles constitute the primary muscles of respiration. Primary muscles of respiration are the key muscles that are used in normal breathing. So the muscles that we use in normal breathing are the primary muscles of respiration. Usually the primary muscles of respiration are the intercostal muscles together with the thoracic diaphragm. You remember that thoracic diaphragm is not necessarily a part of the thoracic wall but ideally, it separates the thoracic wall or rather it separates the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity. So thoracic diaphragm and intercostal muscles are the primary muscles of respiration. We'll be talking about that shortly. Now, what is the role of the internal and external intercostal muscles with regard to respiration. The external intercostal muscles help to expand the chest cavity. When the chest cavity expands, the volume of the chest cavity increases. And so the pressure within the chest cavity goes down. That is what is important during inspiration. So therefore, the external intercostal muscles are key during inspiration. In as much as the opposite may be true for the internal intercostal, that if the internal intercostal contract, the chest cavity collapses and so ideally you reduce the volume of the chest cavity, then now breathing out occurs. In as much as that may be true, we do not really consider the internal intercostal as muscles which are used to breathe out. And the reason is because breathing out doesn't really require muscular energy. Breathing in requires energy. Breathing out is a passive process. But the role of both intercostal muscles and together with even the innermost intercostal is that at least they make the chest wall a rigid column so that doesn't collapse during breathing. And that is for all of them, 
whether external intercostal or internal intercostal or innermost intercostal, they make the chest wall a rigid column so that there is no collapsing. Okay, so these are the intrinsic muscles of the chest wall. Then we have the extrinsic muscles of the chest wall. The extrinsic muscles of the chest wall are ideally muscles which arise from other regions but attach to the ribs. So you may want to ask yourself, where do they come from? The extrinsic muscles either are muscles of the neck which attach to the ribs like these ones, or muscles of the abdomen like these ones which attach to the ribs, or muscles of the upper limb like these ones which attach to the ribs. These muscles constitute the accessory muscles of respiration. We call a muscle accessory if primarily you don't really use it in normal breathing, but you require its services during situations of respiratory distress. And that is exactly what these muscles do. When you require a lot of force for breathing, then the external or rather the extensive muscles of the chest will come into play. And this is one of the important things that will be taught in your clinical years, that in one of the ways in which we can evaluate whether a patient is in respiratory distress is by looking at the involvement of accessory muscles of respiration as they breathe. And especially in children, if a child is in respiratory distress, you'll see them breathing with abdominal muscles or even with the muscle of the neck, they'll be very active. Sometimes you see their head dancing because the muscle of the neck are very active or you see the abdominal abdomen going in and out actively because they're using their abdominal muscles for breathing. The same thing as if you are to push air in a balloon at high pressure, you know that's not normal breathing. So you'll need a lot of muscles, especially your abdominal musculature to contract so that you can breathe actively through or rather breathe a large volume of air. So the point here is that accessory muscles of respiration are used in situations where we need extra effort for breathing. Now, I've told you about the chest wall. I want to now tell you about the dimensions of the chest cavity. The reason why we want to do this is so that we can then understand the mechanisms of ventilation. So there are three dimensions of the chest cavity and there's nothing difficult about this. I just want to conceptualize it in terms of if the chest cavity is a three-dimensional structure, then it will have three dimensions. This distance from the sternum all the way to the vertebral column I want to call it the anteroposterior dimension. This distance from the thoracic inlet to the level of the thoracic diaphragm, let's call it the vertical dimension. And finally, this distance from one side, the end of the ribs there, to this side, let's call it transverse dimension. So we have anteroposterior dimension, vertical dimension, and transverse dimension. During breathing, you increase the volume of the chest cavity. It means that uh, during breathing, at least one, if not all, of these dimensions need to be increased so that you can increase the volume of the chest cavity. So now we can then talk about mechanisms of ventilation. Mechanisms of ventilation are mechanisms that enable us to breathe in. How do we breathe in? We breathe in when the intrathoracic pressure 
goes low so that the atmospheric pressure is higher than the interthoracic pressure. That's what makes air to enter into the chest. But how do we make the intrathoracic pressure lower than atmospheric pressure? We make the intrathoracic pressure be lower than atmospheric pressure by increasing the volume of the chest cavity. So understand that if you want to breathe in, you must then increase the volume of the chest cavity so that the pressure within the chest cavity goes down and that makes atmospheric pressure to enter into the lungs. And if you want to breathe out, then the lungs simply collapse and then air goes out. So the mechanisms of ventilation that I'm going to talk about here are mechanisms that increase the volume of the chest cavity. These mechanisms act by increasing one, at least one of the dimensions of the chest cavity. We've talked about the vertical dimension. We've talked about the transverse dimension and the anterior posterior dimension. Perhaps to take note is that usually the muscles which are actively involved during normal breathing, I've already told you, are the intercostal muscles and the diaphragm. Breathing via the diaphragm is what you're calling diaphragmatic ventilation. Breathing or rather ventilation from the intercostal muscles is what we call costal ventilation. So we have diaphragmatic ventilation and costal ventilation. Anyway, so there are three mechanisms that are present that help us to breathe in. The first mechanism is what we call the diaphragmatic mechanism. The diaphragmatic mechanism is based on the anatomy of the thoracic diaphragm. And what is the anatomy of the thoracic diaphragm? The thoracic diaphragm is dome-shaped. As you can see in this image here, it's dome-shaped. The dome is upwards. So think through what would happen if a dome-shaped muscle like this one contracts. First, what makes the muscle to contract? Remember it's skeletal muscle. This muscle is innervated by the phrenic nerve. So the phrenic nerve is the one that stimulates this muscle to contract. Now, when a dome-shaped muscle like this one contracts, it will be flat. And if it flattens, we increase one of the dimensions. I'm going to tell you the dimension, but before I tell you, I want to think through it. Which dimension do you think the diaphragm increases when it flattens? Okay, so I hope you've already had something in your mind. The dimension, this one, the vertical dimension. Because this is what happens. If this muscle contracts, it will lie somewhere here. So when it lies somewhere there, it means we'll have increased the distance from here to there, which is the original. We'll have increased it from there up to somewhere there. So diaphragmatic mechanism increases the vertical dimension of the chest cavity. If you increase the vertical dimension of the chest cavity, you are going to increase the volume of the chest cavity. And that means that the pressure will go down and so air can rush into the lungs. Take note that this diaphragmatic mechanism is what constitutes 60% of normal breathing. So 60% of normal breathing is due to the mechanisms contributed by the thoracic diaphragm. The second type, the second mechanism of ventilation is known as the bucket handle mechanism. The bucket handle mechanism relies on the anatomy of the lower ribs. 
and specifically here we are talking about rib number eight rib number nine and rib number ten we are not talking about rib 11 and rib 12. this is because rib 11 and 12 are not attached to the others so it can't really form what we are calling the handle of a bucket why are we calling rib number eight, nine, and 10 the handle for bucket? We call it so because look, uh, we agree that the rib number eight, nine, and 10, their cartilage join the cartilage rib above. So posteriorly, if the ribs come from the vertebral column, they usually slant down like this. Then anteriorly, we can see that these ribs are also going back, just like how the handle of a bucket behaves. From the vertebral column, the ribs come out and descend downwards. Then down here, they arc and turn upwards like the way the handle of a bucket is. So the question is, what happens when you raise the handle of a bucket? And just think about your bucket at home, if you have one. What happens when you raise the handle of a bucket? Assuming that you're holding the bucket, the handle with at the center of the handle, where usually there'll be some plastic thing. When you raise that part, you realize that that plastic thing moves away from the bucket. And that's the point here, that when you raise the handle for bucket, like in this case, we have vertebral column we have the sternum here, and this is the lower rib, one example for lower rib. When you raise the handle of a bucket, the distance from where you're touching up to the bucket increases. Now, I want you to imagine that there are two handles, one on one side and one on the other side, just like the way we have in our chest wall, where you have two pairs of, you have pairs, ribs on other side of the chest wall. When you raise the lower ribs, they move away from the center of the body. And that means that we increase the transverse dimension. So the bucket handle mechanism increases the transverse dimension of the chest cavity. The third mechanism of ventilation is what we are calling the pump handle mechanism. The pump handle mechanism is based on the anatomy of the upper ribs. The upper seven ribs are the ones you're talking about here. Look at the anatomy once again. The upper ribs come from the vertebral column and slant downwards to the sternum. They don't curve again up. They just slant down and it ends there. They don't curve upwards. So this applies to rib number one up to number seven. Question is what happens when you raise the upper rib? What happens when you raise the handle of a pump? Now not handle of a bucket. So consider this to be the handle of the pump. Well, Maybe some of you are not familiar with this type of water pumps. They tend to be largely in the village where someone stands on this side and pump this up and down, and then the water pours from the other end into a bucket. So usually this is the pump and this is the handle. For those who are not familiar with that kind of arrangement, let's just look at this one. So this is a vertebral column. This is a sternum and this is an upper rib. Remember the upper rib swings around the vertebral column. That's where the joint is. When you raise this upper rib, it will take the sternum up. But because of the orientation of the upper rib, it will also push the sternum anteriorly. In so doing, when you raise the upper rib, you increase the anteroposterior dimension of the chest cavity. So pump handle mechanism increases the AP dimension. Together, the pump handle mechanism 
as well as the bucket handle mechanism constitute what we call the coastal respiration because here we are now moving the ribs. So we call it coastal respiration. Coastal respiration constitute 40% of normal breathing. These are the mechanisms of ventilation. I hope you've understood them. Now, as we breathe in and out, air is moving in and out. There'll be some functional lung volumes and capacities that we can describe. And this image shows us on our left, the functional lung volumes and on our right, the functional lung capacities. The difference between the volumes and the capacities is that in the capacities, the capacities are additions of one or two volumes. When you add one, two or three volumes, sorry, when you add two or three volumes, you get the capacities. Now let's understand them. I want us to talk about the functional lung volumes. Then we'll talk about the functional lung capacities. I want you to try to do this practically on your end. So just breathe normally in and out, in and out normally for some time. Normal breathing, you are not using any force. So as you breathe in and out normally, this is what we see. When you breathe in, some air enters the lung. When you breathe out, air leaves the lung. Of course, not everything. So air enters, air leaves, air enters, air leaves. You define a particular volume of air during normal breathing. That is what you're calling the tidal volume. The tidal volume is the volume of air inhaled or exhaled during normal breathing. This volume of air is about 500 ml. So just enough. Now the volumes I'm going to use here are volumes of adult male, adult male. So the tidal volumes averages half a liter, basically. The volume of air that we breathe in and out during normal breathing. Then I want to talk about the inspiratory reserve volume. This is the inspiratory reserve volume. I'll tell you to do something practically first before I describe for you what inspiratory reserve volume is. So the way you're breathing, you are breathing in and out normally. I want you, after you've breathed out, to then, sorry, after you've breathed in, as you're breathing in and out, I want you, after you've breathed in, instead of breathing out normally, you continue breathing in. After you breathe in normally, use force as much as you can to then continue breathing in. Okay, I hope you're done. You can breathe normally. Now, the volume of air that you've breathed in after normal breathing in, that extra volume of air that your lungs are able to take in over and above the normal tidal volume is what you're calling the inspiratory reserve volume. The extra volume of air that you are able to breathe in over and above the normal tidal volume. That is what you're calling the inspiratory reserve volume. You realize that you have to use some force. So it's that volume of air that you have to forcefully breathe in 
over and above the normal tidal volume. That volume is about three liters. I want us to now define the expiratory reserve volume, which is this one here. The expiratory reserve volume, as we can see, is that volume of air that you can breathe out forcefully after normal expiration. The volume of air that you can breathe out forcefully after normal expiration. That is what you are calling the expiratory reserve volume. The units, it's about 1.1 liters of air. So the only difference between inspiratory reserve and expiratory reserve is the direction of the breathing. But all of them are forcefully being done beyond the normal tidal volume. The last volume I want to talk about is the residual volume. The residual volume is the volume of air that remains within the lungs after maximal forceful expiration. The volume of air that remains in the lungs after maximal forceful respiration. Sorry, forceful expiration when you breathe out. So if you forcefully exhale air, you don't really finish everything there'll be some volume of air that remain. That's the residual volume. It's about 1.2 liters. Now the importance of the residual volume is to ensure that we still have some pressure within the lung to prevent lung collapse. The residual volume is a volume that prevents lung collapse because it creates some positive pressure in the lungs to prevent the collapse of the lungs. So now you know two things that prevent lung collapse. One is the surfactant chemical, and now the second one, the residual volume. Now we can talk about functional lung capacities. The lung capacities are just gotten from addition of two or more lung volumes. And these are usually done for the sake of uh, diagnosis of particular uh, respiratory conditions, when you put a patient in a machine called spirometer, you are able to calculate these other capacities as well. One of the capacities I want us to describe is the inspiratory capacity. As you can see in this image, the inspiratory capacity is tidal volume, basically tidal volume plus the inspiratory reserve volume. And so it means you're just adding the tidal volume and inspiratory reserve, you get about 3.5 liters of air. By definition, we can describe the inspiratory capacity as the volume of air that someone can forcefully inhale after normal exhalation the volume of air that someone can forcefully inhale after normal exhalation. So that is what we are calling inspiratory capacity. The volume of air that someone can forcefully inhale after normal exhalation, which means you're breathing in, out, in, out. So in, out, then in. After you breathe out, then you breathe in forcefully, you get the inspiratory capacity. Then we have the functional residual capacity. The functional residual capacity is this one. You obtain the functional residual capacity by adding the expiratory reserve volume to the residual volume. By definition, the functional residual capacity 
is the volume of air that remains in the lungs after normal exhalation. The volume of air that remains within the lungs after normal exhalation. That is what you are calling the functional residual capacity. The other capacity to talk about is the vital capacity. We get vital capacity by adding the inspiratory reserve volume, the tidal volume, and the expiratory reserve volume. That is vital capacity. It's about 4.6 liters of air. By definition, what is it? We get vital capacity by first making an individual to breathe out forcefully. So which means that uh, you are breathing in and out, in and out, in and out. Then the person breathes out forcefully. Once the person has breathed out forcefully, then you make them to breathe in forcefully. Then you get the vital capacity. So it's the volume of air that can be forcefully inhaled after forceful exhalation. The volume of air that can be forcefully inhaled after forceful exhalation. That is what you're calling the vital capacity. The last one is total lung volume. We get total lung volume by adding vital capacity to the residual volume. It's about 5.8 liters. How do we define total lung capacity? Total lung capacity is the total amount of air that the lungs can hold. The total volume of air that the lungs can hold. You get this total volume of air that lungs can hold by forcefully breathing in, then everything is measured. Great, so these are the functional lung volumes and the capacities. I told you that the capacities are obtained by adding two or more of the volumes. Now let's talk about physiological dead spaces. Remember that uh, when you're breathing in and out normally, it's not that everything that you've inhaled will participate in gas exchange. Not everything that we inhale participates in gas exchange. There's some volume of air that we inhale that does not participate in gas exchange. So by definition, the physiological dead spaces refer to the volume of air inhaled but does not participate in gas exchange. The volume of air inhaled that does not participate in gas exchange. Ask yourself, why would you inhale air and that air does not participate in gas exchange? There are two reasons. Either the volume does not reach regions of gas exchange or there's a problem with the gas exchange unit. And for that reason, there are two types of physiological dead spaces. This is what we call the anatomical dead space. The anatomical dead space refers to the volume of air that remains within the conducting portion. You see, when you inhale, air has gone into your lungs, yes, all the way to the alveolar, yes. But there's still some air in the trachea that cannot participate in gas exchange. There's still some air in your nasal cavity that cannot participate in gas exchange. They see some air in the bronchi or the bronchioles 
which cannot participate in gas exchange. So the air that remains in the conducting portion, definitely there'll be some air remaining there. That air is what you're calling the anatomical dead space. This anatomical dead space is about 150 ml. Now I want to ask a question as I collect the attendance. Oh, you already registered, but I realize not everyone who registered attended the first one. So the question I'm asking you, which I want you to answer by texting in the chat is this. I've told you that uh, the anatomical dead space is 150 ml. So the question is, during normal breathing, how much volume of air actually reach the alveoli in a single breath? The volume of air that reaches the alveoli in a single breath is how much? So right in the chat there, I've made it open and I'm closing it after 30 seconds. All right, they're coming in. Hey, I'm just looking at the results and some people are allergic to mathematics, I tell you. So most of you have gotten it right. 350 ml. I'm shocked some people have written 5.5 liters. Some people have written 125 ml. That's a you may talk up. Others have written 2850. Anyway, so we agree that uh, the normal tidal volume is 500 ml. And now out of that 500 ml that you're taking in, we are saying that 150 is remaining the airways. So it means that 350 is the one that reaches the alveoli. Great. The second type of physiological dead space is what you call the alveolar dead space. The alveolar dead space refers to the air that reaches poorly perfused alveoli. So remember I told you that the dead space is the volume of air that is inhaled but does not participate in gas exchange. And there could be many reasons why the air inhaled cannot participate in gas exchange. So this is one of the reasons. Maybe the air has gone in, yes, and has reached the alveolar, yes. However, that air cannot participate in gas exchange because the alveoli don't have vascularization. They are poorly perfused or we can just say they lack blood vessels. In a normal person, the alveolar dead space should be zero. You shouldn't have some value here in a normal person. But in cases of disease, there are some regions of the alveoli that may not be perfused. For example, in a patient who has pulmonary embolism, so there's a region, maybe because a blood vessel has been blocked, there's a lung segment that does not have blood vessels. So it doesn't matter even if you take in air there, there'll be no gas exchange. Alveolar dead space should be zero in a normal person, but it increases in disease process. And that is why sometimes therefore, you have to supplement <coughs> by giving oxygen such okay high levels of oxygen to someone like for example in icu setup okay <clears throat> now we can talk about mechanisms of gas transport <clears throat> 
We look at mechanisms of transportation of oxygen, as well as mechanisms of transportation of carbon dioxide. Let's start with the mechanisms of transportation of oxygen. So the loading of oxygen occurs in the lungs. Remember blood is what is transporting the gases, by the way. I made that assumption. Remember, the gases are being transported by blood. So we want to see how blood transport the two types of gases within the body. So blood is loaded with oxygen in the lungs. What I mean is that when blood enters the lungs, then that blood acquires oxygen. It becomes oxygenated. When blood reaches the tissues, it gets rid of that oxygen. And that's what I'm calling unloading. The key mechanisms that underlie oxygen transportation are these ones. 97% of oxygen in blood <clears throat> is bound to the hemoglobin molecule. The hemoglobin molecule is within the red blood cells. So 97% of oxygen is bound to hemoglobin. It is transported by hemoglobin. One hemoglobin molecule usually carry four molecules of oxygen. However, 3% of oxygen that is in the blood is dissolved. It can be dissolved in the water within the plasma, and that is 1.5%, but it can also be dissolved within the cytoplasm of the red blood cells, and that is another 1.5%. So I'll say that again. 97% of oxygen that is in the blood is within, is, or rather is bound to hemoglobin, which is in the red blood cells. 3% of oxygen that is in the blood is dissolved, either in the water, in the plasma, or in the water, in the cytoplasm of red blood cells. I repeated that because I want to ask you a question. The question is this, so what percentage of oxygen in the blood is carried by red blood cells? What percentage of oxygen in the blood is carried by red blood cells? Okay, you can do it in form of a chart. Just write the percentage of oxygen in blood that is carried by red blood cells. Anyway, majority have gotten it right. So it is 98.5%. And the answer is still just glaring at you. 98.5% of oxygen is carried by red blood cells. So, Usually, oxygen molecule combine loosely and reversibly with hemoglobin. We are accounting for the 97%. Oxygen usually binds to hemoglobin when there is high levels of oxygen concentration. And that is what happens in the lungs. In the lungs, we have high levels of oxygen concentration and so oxygen binds to hemoglobin. And that is why now blood is able to carry oxygen bound to hemoglobin. However, when the concentration of oxygen is low, 
as what happens in the tissues, then hemoglobin loses or releases the oxygen molecule. And that is what happens in the tissues. So at the tissue level, oxygen and hemoglobin dissociate so that now oxygen can go to the tissues through diffusion. So if you look at how blood flows, <clears throat> now the gases are usually measured in what we call partial pressure. The sign for partial pressure is this one P. So when you talk of PO2, we mean partial pressure of oxygen. Pressure is usually measured in millimeters of mercury. We will not go into the how we calculate partial pressures of oxygen and carbon dioxide. So let's just take the values. The mechanism, the, the formula of calculating the pressures are not for your scope. But let's understand this. In the lungs, when blood enters through the pulmonary arteries, that blood that is entering from the right chambers of the lungs through the pulmonary arteries have about, the PO2 there is usually about 40 millimeters of mercury. These are very low pressure of oxygen. Usually about 40 millimeters of mercury in the pulmonary arteries. So this is what you call the deoxygenated blood basically. So as blood passes through the capillaries within the lungs, there is some exchange. Through diffusion, the pressure of oxygen within the alveolar is one of four millimeters of mercury. And so by the time blood is reaching this level, that pressure has been equalized. So that the pressure of oxygen in the blood is the same as the pressure of oxygen within the alveoli, one of four millimeters of mercury. So in the pulmonary veins, therefore, the pressures of oxygen have risen to one of four millimeters of mercury compared to the pressures in the arterial end of the pulmonary vasculature, which is 40 millimeters of mercury. The pressure of oxygen changes from the pulmonary veins as it enters the heart because there's some level of mixing of this pulmonary, the blood in the pulmonary veins mixes with the blood in the bronchial veins. In the morning, I told you that we have bronchial vessels and pulmonary vessels. The bronchial vein carried the oxygenated blood the blood in the bronchial vein may mix with the blood in the pulmonary veins. Because of that mixing, the concentration of oxygen will go down so that by the time it's reaching the left chambers of the heart, that blood is about between 95 to 100 millimeters of mercury. So, I want you to understand that there's some mixing the lungs there. Okay, the blood in the left chambers of the heart is ranging from 95 to 100 millimeters of mercury. So that is the same concentration that is carried through the arteries and even arterioles up to the level of the capillaries. When it reaches the capillaries, which is now interchanging the tissues, look at the concentration of oxygen within the cells, very low. How about in the interstitial tissue, about 40 millimeters of mercury, compared to inside the cells, which is about 23 millimeters of mercury. So now what happened is that the capillary, oxygen in the capillary, will have to dissociate from the hemoglobin and enter into the tissues because now we have lower concentration of oxygen in the tissues compared to in the bloodstream. And so that happens as blood moves through the capillaries in the tissues, so that by the time we are going beyond that tissue to the veins, the concentration of oxygen in the venules is similar to the concentration of oxygen within the interstitial fluid. Uh, 
which is 40 millimeters of mercury. And this is what is translated therefore here. By the time it's reaching the pulmonary veins, we have 40 millimeters of mercury. Let's represent what I've told you in a graph this way. On the vertical axis, let's have the partial pressures of oxygen. And uh, on the horizontal axis, let's have the different vascular beds that the blood is traveling through. We can start with the systemic veins. So when you talk of systemic veins, we are referring to veins such as the femoral vein, the inferior vena cava, the superior vena cava, those kind of veins. The concentration of oxygen in terms of partial pressure in the systemic veins is about 40 millimeters of mercury because that is what is coming out from the capillaries. Now, that blood in the systemic veins will enter the heart through the right chambers of the heart and then go to the pulmonary artery. When it goes to the pulmonary artery, it reaches the lungs. When that blood is passing through the lung capillaries, it will increase the concentration of oxygen from 40 millimeters of mercury to around one of four millimeters of mercury. And that is what we call loading. So oxygen, the blood is loaded with oxygen in the lungs. I told you that it will reach about 104 millimeters of mercury, but because of mixing with the bronchial veins, the concentration goes down slightly. It will go down to about 95 to 100 millimeters of mercury. And that is what will be reaching the left chambers of the heart. And that means that even the arteries will be having that level of concentration. That mixing of blood is an example of a shunt, although it's a physiological shunt. You remember we talked about shunting when you're talking about cardiovascular malformations and fetal circulation. When you mix oxygenated with deoxygenated blood, that's also a type of shunt. So because of the pulmonary shunt, the concentration of oxygen goes down to between 95 to 100. And that is what is then we have in the systemic arteries. From the systemic arteries, we go to arterioles, then capillaries. When blood is in the systemic capillaries, which means in the tissues, the concentration of oxygen will again go down because we are now delivering oxygen to the tissue. And that is what we have called unloading. So unloading of oxygen occurs in the tissues, loading of oxygen occurs in the lungs. From the tissues, the concentration of oxygen move from what we've talked about to around 40 millimeters of mercury. And that is what we have in the systemic veins. We started from the systemic veins and we've ended at the systemic veins. So that is the oxygen concentration curve. How about carbon dioxide transport? How is carbon dioxide transported? So carbon dioxide loading occurs in the tissues. The blood is loaded with carbon dioxide in the tissues, but it is unloaded in the lungs. There are three mechanisms that help in the transportation of carbon dioxide. One of the mechanisms is this. 70% of carbon dioxide in the blood is carried in form of bicarbonate molecule. 70% of carbon dioxide is carried in form of bicarbonate molecule. Now this is what happened. Once carbon dioxide reaches the blood, it reacts with water. 
And when it reacts with the water, it forms this molecule, which we are calling carbonic acid. So carbon dioxide reacts with water to form a weak carbonic acid. This weak carbonic acid then dissociates into two, hydrogen ion and bicarbonate. So this bicarbonate here is the one that is carrying oxygen molecule, sorry, carrying carbon dioxide molecule. 70% of carbon dioxide is transported in blood through that mechanism. Usually in the tissues, the forward reaction is the one that takes place. When this blood reaches the lungs, the reverse reaction occurs. So bicarbonate combines with hydrogen to form carbonic acid, which then dissociates into carbon dioxide and water. Okay, the second major mechanism, okay, maybe it's not major now, but the second mechanism in which carbon dioxide in blood is carried is when the carbon dioxide binds into some molecules. They could be the plasma proteins or even hemoglobin itself. So the point here is that carbon dioxide binds to molecules. They are protein molecules. Hemoglobin is still a protein molecule. Plasma proteins are still protein molecules. Carbon dioxide binds to proteins to form what we call carb amino proteins. They form the carb amino proteins. The carb amino proteins are proteins which are bound carbon dioxide molecule. This is responsible for about 23% of carbon dioxide. The last percentage, 7% of carbon dioxide is dissolved within the water in the blood. That's plasma water. So these are the mechanisms of transporting carbon dioxide. So let's see, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the arteries is usually about 40 millimeters of mercury. So blood still has some level of carbon dioxide. The partial pressure of carbon dioxide within the interstitial tissue is 45, but within the cells, it's 46. So, this blood here, which is the oxygenated blood, it has low levels of carbon dioxide, 40. As carbon dioxide passes through the tissues, this carbon dioxide will diffuse into the capillaries so that by the time we're on the venous end of the capillary, the concentration of carbon dioxide in the tissue, interstitial tissue, will be similar to the concentration of carbon dioxide within the veins, we raise it by five. So we get 45 millimeters of mercury. This is the partial pressure of carbon dioxide within the veins. And this is the partial pressure of carbon dioxide within the tissues, within the arteries, sorry. So when this blood enters, reaches the lungs, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide will be at 45 millimeters of mercury. Then now the unloading of carbon dioxide occurs so that the partial pressure of carbon dioxide drops from 40 millimeters of mercury to 40 millimeters of mercury, similar to the concentration of carbon dioxide within the alveoli, which is at 40. We agreed that we are not looking into the formula of calculation of the partial pressures. So let's just see the values. That is how carbon dioxide is transported. I'll give you 10 minutes break. When we come back, we look at development and congenital malformations of the respiratory system. If you have a question, you can just put in the chat. The chat is open for you. Um, you can just put your question publicly or privately if you wish. I'll answer them when we come back. 
Okay, we can now look at development of the respiratory system. Before I take you through development of the, of the respiratory system, I'll remind you of something we did in basic embryology about embryonic folding. We say that the embryo folds both in transverse as well as in longitudinal axis. When the embryo falls, the yolk sac is incorporated into the embryo. The part of the yolk sac that is incorporated into the embryo constitute what we call the primordial gut. As you can see in this image, this is the primordial gut. The primordial gut is described to have three parts. You have the foregut, this is the part near the mouth. The midgut, this is the part connected with the yolk sac, which is outside the yolk sac that's supposed to involute, where this is the vitelline duct. And the hindgut, the hindgut is the one connected to the allantois. So foregut, midgut, and hindgut, those are parts of the primordial gut. The foregut, midgut, and hindgut have some derivatives. In terms of segments, the foregut extend from the level of the pharynx to the level of the duodenum. The midgut extend from the level of the duodenum to the level of the transverse column. So from here, all the way to somewhere there, represent foregut, which coincides with pharynx all the way to the duodenum. Then around this zone here is the midgut, which corresponds with the region going to give you the duodenum all the way to the transverse column. Then this zone here is hindgut, which corresponds to the region that's going to give us the transverse column to the anus. These are parts of the primordial gut with their derivatives. The respiratory system arises from the foregut. And this diverticulum here is the diverticulum for the respiratory system. So the respiratory system arises on the ventral aspect of the embryonic foregut, this being the foregut up to there, then midgut there, then hindgut. The embryonic foregut, the ventral aspect of the embryonic foregut is the one that gives us the lower respiratory tree. So this will coincide with the level of the larynx downwards, come from the foregut. Okay, so what are the stages of lung development? Overall, in terms of timing, there are three stages, the embryonic stage, the fetal stage, and the postnatal stage. But in terms of the morphological events that take place, we describe them into five stages, and I'll be clarifying what falls where. Let's start with the embryonic stage of lung development. During the embryonic stage of lung development, that is when the respiratory diverticulum forms from the ventral foregut. That means that that outgrowth from the ventral foregut appears. After it has grown out, it divides into these two knobs, which look like this. The right and the left bud, we call them the lung bud. So the embryonic stage of development is where the, during that period when the respiratory diverticulum forms and at the end, at the lower end of the respiratory diverticulum, we have formation of the lung buds, the right and the left lung bud. That is the embryonic stage of development. So the morphological stage is called embryonic stage. In terms of period, it is still the embryonic period. So that goes 
like that, that one corresponds. So after the embryonic period, remember we agree that embryonic period was week three to week eight of development. After embryonic period, we go to the fetal period of development. During the fetal period of development, there's some morphological stages that take place and actually all these take place during the fetal period of development. So what happens? After the lung buds have been formed, we go to what we call the pseudoglandular stage of development. During the pseudoglandular stage of development, we have branching of the airways. So remember, we had formed lung buds. This right and left lung bud actually corresponds to the primary or the main bronchus. So they correspond to the right main bronchus and the left main bronchus. During the pseudoglandular stage, we have branching of the airway. And this branching continues all the way to the 16th generation of airway division. It continues all the way to the terminal bronchial, the 16th generation of branching. So remember, this is the first branching it continues up to the 16th generation of branching, which we called the terminal bronchial. That is what happens in the pseudoglandular stage. After pseudoglandular stage, we go to the canalicular stage. The understanding here is that during the pseudoglandular stage, the airways are branching, but they're just solid structures. They don't have a lumen. Their lumen is blocked. So during the canalicular stage, we have canalization of the airways. It means that a lumen appears within the airways. That is the principal thing that happens during the canalicular stage. Apart from that, during the canalicular stage, we also form the respiratory bronchioles. Remember, this is generation 17 to 19 of airway division. So the 17th to the 19th generation of airway division appear during the canalicular stage of development. After that, we have the circular stage of development. The circular stage of development is that period when we form the alveolar sacs. Remember, these were now extending from now the <clears throat> beyond the 19th generation, which means 20th all the way to 23rd, 24th there. We form the alveolar sacs. Alveolar sacs form at the circular stage. We call the circular st stage or terminal sac stage because the ends of the airway are the ones that balloon out. It is during this period that also we differentiate the different types of alveolar cells. The type one and the type two alveolar cells differentiate. And that means that they can begin to then secrete surfactant. So surfactant secretion begins around this time. Although the amount of surfactant that is being secreted by the fetal lung at this time is not adequate but it's there. And then finally, we have the alveolar stage of development. The alveolar stage of development begins at around 34 weeks of gestation. So this is not accurate here. It begins at around 34 weeks of gestation, but it continues even beyond the time of birth this alveolar stage of development continues beyond the fetal period up to the postnatal period, up to seven years of life. During the alveolar stage of development, we have formation of the alveoli. Fewer alveoli are actually formed before birth. The, most of the alveoli you have right now are alveoli that formed after you were born within the first seven years of life. 
during the alveolar stage also, of course, there is increased production of surfactant. So these are the stages of lung development. Morphologically, we talk about those five stages, but in terms of period, we talk about these three stages. Pseudoglandular, canalicular, circular, and part of alveolar stage fall within the fetal period of development. The postnatal period, we only have the latter end of the alveolar stage, but it extends up to seven years after birth. So way into childhood, the lungs are still developing. Having said that, I want to now take you through congenital malformations of the respiratory system. The first congenital anomaly I want to talk about is what we call coronal atresia. The term atresia means blocked. So it may simply means that the coana is blocked. Now, this is how the coana should be. Air should come through the nostrils, pass through the nasal cavity, go through the coana to the pharynx. If the coana is blocked, like in this case, this child cannot breathe normally. They have to breathe through the mouth. So the images here show you coronal atresia. This is the nasal cavity. This is the nasopharynx. Air should move freely from the nasal cavity to the nasopharynx. But now here, we see some membranes. And even in this child, it's even thicker here. This is coronal atresia. Blockage of the coana. So these children breathe through their mouth. Can have what we call tracheoesophageal fistula, or in combination, what we call esophageal atresia. Esophageal atresia and tracheoesophageal fistula is an entity of malformations which are largely due to abnormal communication between the trachea and the esophagus. This happens if the septation of the foregut, remember I told you that the lower respiratory system come from the foregut, just like where the esophagus also comes from. So it means that we need to separate tract and esophagus at some point during development. If that separation does not occur properly, then we can get abnormal communication between the trachea and the esophagus. There are different morphological patterns and that is why we also have just a spectrum of the malformation. You may just have esophageal atresia alone, which means esophagus is blocked, like what we can see here. That is esophageal atresia without affecting the trachea. There is nothing wrong with the trachea. It is just an isolated esophageal atresia. You can have that one. But you can also have a scenario where now there is variable involvement between the trachea and the esophagus. And the images in the middle show you situation where the tubular esophagus is not continuous. So that's what we are calling esophageal atresia. The tubular, the lumen, the tubular lumen of the esophagus is not continuous. You see here, the tubular lumen is not continuous. We call it esophageal atresia. Here, the tubular lumen again is not continuous. So it is still esophageal atresia just like this one and that one. Unlike the last one where the tubular lumen is continuous. So let's ignore this one for a moment. So the first one, second, third, and fourth all have esophageal atresia, but the second, the third, and the fourth also have abnormal communication between the trachea and the esophagus. And those are the ones we are calling tracheoesophageal fistula. Then the last one, has abnormal communication between the tract and the esophagus. So it's a tracheoesophageal fistula, but the tibular esophagus is continuous. So there is no esophageal atresia. And that's why I'm calling it this one. You can have esophageal atresia and or tracheoesophageal fistula. That's one entity of malformation. I've already told you that it's failure of formation of that tubular lumen of the esophagus. That's what you're calling esophageal atresia. Or you may have abnormal communication in the trachea and the esophagus. And that is what you're calling tracheoesophageal fistula. 
This is due to abnormal septation of the foregut. So there are different entities with different clinical presentation. And I want you to look at these images again and tell me out of these three, which child will have distension of the abdomen even without eating? Is it type A, type B, type C, type D, or type E? Even without eating, which child here will have a distended abdomen even without eating? You will answer that in the poll. Just say A, B, C, D. Uh, let me enable that for you. Okay, you are enabled. So just write A, B, C, or D. You can see them there. Which child will have distended abdomen even without eating? You have 30 seconds. Look at the first one. In the first one, the esophagus is blocked, but the trachea is okay. So this child will not be able to eat. If they breastfeed, that milk will just come back to the mouth. So how do you know a child has this malformation? Usually they have a lot of secretions in the mouth and the baby cannot breastfeed and usually when we are in a hospital setup, we'll try to insert what you call nasogastric tube. That nasogastric tube will refuse to go down. You'll make that diagnosis. But they're breathing normally, they're not choking. In the second child where most of you are saying B, in this second child, this baby will feed, but the moment they feed, they choke. You see, this one is not choking. It's just that the food is not going down. But this one will choke because food goes to the lungs. This one is going to choke. These are the kind of babies, if they do that when they're born, you don't encourage the mother. Nyonyesha too, you'll kill that child. If we insert the nasogastric tube, it will enter, yes, into the lungs. So again, that means when you're inserting, the baby will react in a particular way, then you know that the nasogastric tube is in the lungs, it is not in the stomach. So you don't give feeds. The one I asked you was this one. The baby cannot feed, yet the abdomen is just distending. And the reason the abdomen is distending is because it is distending with air. This child is breathing and the air goes to the stomach as it goes to the lungs. Of course, the ones in the lungs can go back, the ones in the stomach stay there. So the abdomen is just distended, but the baby is not feeding. If you try to insert a nasogastric tube, it will not go down. That is how you make a diagnosis of this type of tracheosophageal fistula. And you realize that the commonest type of tracheosophageal fistula that will be coming across. So you need to know it. In this one, the baby chokes, but also, the abdomen also distends. For those who say D, that is still okay. In type D, the baby also has a distended abdomen. But this baby, when they feed, they choke. So that means they'll not continue feeding. This one, food does not go down completely. They don't choke though. In the last one, the last one is a bit difficult to pick at birth. So these ones usually pick them a bit late, maybe in two years, three years, sometimes even seven years I've seen, where a child has a tracheosophageal fistula without esophageal atresia. So they can feed normally, they breathe normally, but they tend to have recurrent respiratory tract infections. This is what they present with because of that channel so the things in the stomach, in the esophagus, they track little, little, they track to the airways. And usually you see the orientation there, 
does not necessarily make food go all the way to the lungs. Usually very little will move into the lung. That's why these ones are diagnosed much later than the other types of tachycephalia fistulae. So the one I want to know is this one inside out because you'll come across this one often. Another malformation is what we call bronchogenic cyst. This is due to abnormal budding of the foregut from the tracheobronchial tree. So you just have a cyst basically that contain mucous material. We call that bronchogenic cyst. They are very common. They're usually located around within the mediastinum basically. Bronchial atresia is blockage of the bronchus. So if you have blockage of one of the bronchus, then we call that bronchial atresia. You can have failure formation of one lung. One lung is completely absent. That is what we call pulmonary agenesis. Like in this case, the lung that is absent is the one on the right. This is the right, this is the left. Dark means there is air and air means this lung. So the left lung, you're using that label, the left lung is present and has even now expanded to occupy the position that is not occupied by the right lung, which is missing here. And that's why you see when this chest, the side with normal lung is expanded compared to this other side that's abnormal. Pulmonary agenesis is congenital absence of one lung. I'm talking about one lung because congenital absence of both lungs is not compatible with life. So that child cannot reach this point of you taking a radiograph. You can also have underdevelopment of the lungs and that's what we call pulmonary hypoplasia. This commonly occurs where you have hernias or you have oligohydramnios. So anyway, oligohydramnios will give you pulmonary hypoplasia. The other thing that will give you pulmonary hypoplasia is any congenital malformation that make the chest cavity small. Either it could be because of hernias from the diaphragm or some problem with the diaphragm will make the lungs not develop fully. We have what you call pulmonary sequestration. This is where you have an aberrant lung tissue. That aberrant lung tissue has no communication with the airways. It is lung tissue, but it is not in communication with the airways. So that means that uh, it doesn't really participate in gas exchange. Usually also it does not have any communication with the pulmonary arteries. Actually it has communication with the systemic vessels. So we call it pulmonary sequestration or accessory lung tissue, like in this case. One of the commonest syndromes that you're going to come across and if you're working in uh, BC maternity unit, almost every day you'll be seeing one, is this one, respiratory distress syndrome of the newborn. So you need to know it because you'll be coming across it almost on a daily basis if you're working in a BC maternity unit. Respiratory distress syndrome of the newborn may not necessarily be a congenital malformation, but a condition that the newborn will be born with. This occurs in a child who has been born prematurely. So it occurs in premature babies. If a baby is born prematurely, the, their lungs don't have enough amount of surfactant that is adequate to expand the lungs. And so what happens is that when they're born, their lungs just collapse. And if the lungs collapse, it means that there is impaired oxygenation. If the alveoli collapse, the gas exchange is not efficient. So the child will present in respiratory distress. That's what we call respiratory distress syndrome 
of the newborn. Pathologically, we call it the hyaline membrane disease. So sometimes you can come across the term hyaline membrane disease is the same as respiratory distress syndrome of the newborn. Um, I don't think you'd understand the, the concepts in the radiograph. So let me just leave it to what I've told you because now I have to teach you how to interpret radiographs first before we can then make a diagnosis of respiratory distress syndrome of the newborn in these images. So just take it from what I've told you. The, the baby has been born prematurely. So that means that the surfactant is not adequate because the surfactant production begins from the canalicular stage, okay, maybe from the terminal sac stage onwards. So if, you buy, if the child is born prematurely, they'll not have enough surfactant. If they don't have enough surfactant, the lungs cannot fully expand. And that is why there is respiratory distress. I'll talk about congenital malformations of the thoracic diaphragm as well. And the one you're seeing here is where there's a defect in the thoracic diaphragm. And so the abdominal organs have gone to the thorax. This would be a cause of pulmonary hypoplasia. We call this congenital diaphragmatic hernia, where there's a defect in the diaphragm and so abdominal organs have reached the thorax. This was actually a post-mortem, the baby died. You can have a scenario where the musculature of the diaphragm is not present. So when the musculature is not present, the dome of the diaphragm will be high because there's no muscle that causes it to contract to go down. So you can see this side here, the dome of the diaphragm is quite high compared to this dome. This is what we call a ventration of the diaphragm. They have abnormal contour of one hemidiaphragm. We call it a ventration of the diaphragm. This also causes pulmonary hypoplasia. That lung cannot develop fully. Right, so that's what I had for you.